Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream is made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. I have always wanted to do that. Uh, good morning, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm U.S. Senator Rob Portman. It's my privilege to be able to welcome you to today's discussion of the past, present, and future of reentry programs in Northeast Ohio. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks to everyone for helping to ensure that all of our neighbors, everyone in our communities, has a chance at a second chance. Um, it's my view people should not be defined by their mistakes. And that's really what this panel will be about in the discussion today. 95% of the people who are currently in jail or prison will be released someday. 95%. Um, and unfortunately, more than half of those who are released are now back in the system, back in jail or prison, within two or three years. That's the revolving door. That recidivism costs taxpayers millions of dollars. It destroys families. It increases crime. It tears apart our communities. When I was in the U.S. House of Representatives, I was the original author of what's called the Second Chance Act. In fact, one of the original co-authors was then Cleveland Democratic Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones. Uh, next week will mark eight years since that bill was signed into law by President Bush. The Second Chance Act takes a small part of the funds we spend locking people up and invests it in breaking the cycle of recidivism through a number of programs focused on drug recovery programs, job training, mental health treatment, and other services. It has now supported hundreds of local and state agencies, nonprofits, community and faith-based organizations that are working to help transition inmates back into their communities with the support they need to break the grip of addiction, to get important skills, to be able to get back to work, uh, to stay out of prison. And by the way, it's also spawned many thousands of reentry coalitions around the country, including here in the state of Ohio. Some of us talked about this earlier, but I think we had a few reentry coalitions, including here in Northeast Ohio, one of the leaders nationally in this issue. Now over 70 counties in Ohio have these reentry coalitions, uh, partly to be able to apply for funding from the Second Chance Act. Over the past 10 years, we've seen the rate of recidivism in Ohio drop by 11 percent. This means the savings of millions of dollars to the taxpayer. It represents untold numbers of moms and dads who are now back in their kids' lives, untold numbers of new crimes that are never committed, and it means stronger families, safer communities. Second Chance Act has brought more than $19 million in grant funding to Ohio. Ohio has been one of the most aggressive states in using it. Um, the uh, unfortunate fact is that although we fight every year for the appropriation, and we do get appropriations every year for it, the program has actually lost its authorization. In other words, it's already expired, and so we're fighting now to get it reauthorized. Uh, I'm doing this in the Senate on a bipartisan basis with Democratic Senator Pat Leahy, the ranking member on the Judiciary Committee. Our legislation is not just bipartisan, it's also identical to legislation that's been introduced in the House. So it's bicameral and bipartisan. And it basically improves on the legislation based on the evidence of what has worked and not worked with the current Second Chance Act. Uh, I'm also sponsored what's called the Fair Chance Act, which would move the criminal history inquiries to the end of the government hiring process. Uh, after a conditional offer has been made. This is really important because you've got more than 70 million Americans now who have some sort of criminal history. We're told that a criminal record reduces the likelihood of a callback or job offer by nearly 50 percent for men. For African American men, by the way, it's about 60 percent. And not being able to get a job makes it a lot easier to slip back into criminal activity and wind up back in jail. Uh, there are 18 states that already have similar policies in place. Uh, and companies like Target, Walmart, Home Depot have recognized this problem and changed their own hiring practices. It's time for the federal government to do the same thing. Some of the people who need a second chance are struggling with addiction. Uh, many people can't find a good job because they can't pass the drug test. That certainly is true here in, in our state. Um, and again, even if they can't find a job, this addiction makes it a lot harder for them to keep that job. We've been also working in the Senate on that, as some of us talked about this morning. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we passed a legislation called the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, or CARA. Uh, this legislation 
was passed in the Senate after about two and a half weeks on the floor and three years of work by a 94 to one vote. That never happens in the United States Senate. Um, and um, the legislation, <laughs> thank you. The legislation does relate directly to what we're talking about here because as you know, uh, addiction too often is the reason people end up in the criminal justice system in the first place and throwing people in jail or prison uh, is not proven successful in order to deal with that addiction issue. This bill provides resources for diversion programs for people who face criminal charges because of an addiction to get them into treatment. It expands the treatment offered within the criminal justice system to include medication assisted treatment. Uh, it expands educational programs for offenders in prisons and jails and juvenile facilities so we can do a better job of helping individuals get that education as they re-enter the workforce while they're in prison. Getting these two bills to the president's desk and signed into law um, is important to communities in Ohio and it's important work, but much more important is what's going on in our communities, much more important. And that's what we're here to talk about today with uh, an incredible panel. And again, Northeast Ohio has been a leader in this over the years. These panelists are making a real difference in people's lives. Um, they're providing job training, um, other programs. They're helping people develop these skills so that they can indeed establish a stable livelihood and get the dignity and self-respect that comes from work um, and live out their God-given potential. I know that because I've seen their work firsthand. Um, I'd like to recognize each for their efforts and um, again say it's a real honor to be here with them today. Uh, I'm going to introduce them, not in the order they're seated, so you're going to have to raise your hand to make sure people know who you are. The first person I'd like to introduce is my friend Brandon Grotowski. Um, Brandon was just named a CNN hero for 2016. He was already our hero. Uh, so many of you have been to Edwin's. Uh, many of you support Edwin's, and thank you for that. I've, I've had the honor of going there and eating an incredible meal, but also touring the facility, talking to the people who uh, are being trained there, and it is extraordinary. Having had that experience, uh, I hosted Brandon and one of his students in Washington, D.C., and they served a meal, a Brandon's meal, uh, Edwin's meal, to about 50 United States senators. But before we let them eat, they first had to hear from, uh, from Brandon and his student, and they did an awesome job. Um, and uh, my colleagues still talk about it. Um, but thanks to Brandon's leadership, hundreds of our fellow citizens have shown what one can accomplish when given a second chance. And, and that's a great story, not just for Cleveland, really for our country. Uh, one proof of that is another one of our panelists, Ernie Drain is here. Ernie is a graduate from Edwin's, and uh, I spoke to Ernie this morning. He was there when I was there, um, uh, and with Reverend Macon and his wife, and uh, I asked him, uh, okay, what are you doing now? You're a graduate. Ladies and gentlemen, he's working, and he's working in a great restaurant here in Cleveland. And you, you probably served a few people who are here. Yeah. Good, good tippers or fair? Okay, yeah. That's what I thought. Um, Charles C. is here. He's a pioneer in this area. Um, I think it was back in 2013 when we, when we visited uh, you and your facility and had a chance to tour what they're doing. And, and Charles also set up a roundtable discussion at that time, and that helped us to get input for both the CARA legislation and the reauthorization of Second Chance Act. And I asked him this morning about one of the uh, men I met that day, asked how he was doing, because uh, I talk about him and think about him a lot. And uh, he's doing well, uh, which, is, which is great. About uh, a little bit younger than me, had been in and out of the system maybe six, six, six times, he said, uh, ever since he was a kid, and uh, never had a home. Um, and his name is Melvin. And uh, Melvin now not only has a home, has an apartment, has a job, but he has been reunited with his daughter, who's now living with him. And uh, he was a very proud, proud man, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, it was uh, a great experience to see what they're doing um, at the Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry. Uh, they've been doing this for more than 30 years. Uh, Charles has served in community-based corrections programs. He's worked with young people, worked with adults. Uh, our community is a lot better off thanks to his commitment, his leadership, his dedication. Uh, they're helping people gain employment locate stable housing, access counseling and support, obtain second chances, and become self-sufficient, productive members of the community. Uh, Damian Calvert is also with us. Damian is a success story as well. Uh, 
He participated in the Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries Friend of Friend program. Uh, Damien and I talked this morning a little bit about what he's doing now. He is currently a research assistant at Case Western Reserve's Social Justice Institute. Uh, it was a really privilege to meet you this morning and get a chance to visit a little bit and talk about some of the work you're doing to help others be able to get their second chance, Damien. Thank you for being here today, and thanks for your commitment. Um, you transformed your life, and you're helping other people do the same thing. Our moderator today is Rachel DeSell. Many of you know Rachel. She's a reporter and investigative journalist for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, has been since 2002. She has done some extraordinary work. Uh, she's now working on lead exposure, particularly for our children, doing some groundbreaking work there. She's perhaps best known for her investigative work that has led to the conviction of more than 100 rapists and the reinvestigation of more than 400 previously unsolved cases. She's also an adjunct professor at her alma mater, Kent State University, and uh, she's a mentor to kids uh, aging out of foster care, another really important issue, kids aging out of the foster care system and participates in several therapeutic programs for children who have witnessed violence. I now turn the program over to you, Rachel, and uh, thank you all very much for being here. Thanks so much for taking care of the introductions for us. Now we can move right into our discussion. Um, but briefly, I wanted to say that you know, reentry is an issue that I've covered probably in parts of other stories for more than a decade, reporting on the juvenile and adult justice systems. Um, but on a more personal note, uh, you know, one of my little sisters was released from prison just two months ago after serving nine months um, for a drug-related offense. And in talking to, to Damien and Ernie, I can only hope that she'll get the support to achieve the type of successes that you guys have. So um, I kind of wanted to start with Charles because the panel is supposed to be past, present, and future. Um, and we have to fit those into a short amount of time. So I'm hoping that um, you can help by maybe setting the stage to talk a little bit about reentry's past. You know, you've been involved in this work for decades supporting people who return home after a period of incarceration. Uh, what, if anything, do you think has changed since you started doing this work several decades ago? Well, thank you very much, Rachel. And I'd also like to say hello to the folks in the audience, particularly my staff partners at uh, Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry over there, and the, all the folks here that I know over the years. Uh, you know, I think about uh, reentry. I started, you know, b way back in 1974, there were about 8,000 people uh, incarcerated in the state of Ohio at that time. You know, you, move, you fast forward that uh, to today, we've got 50,000 people in 28 prisons ac across the state of Ohio. The recent uh, corrections budget was uh, $3.14 billion. So I think the criminal justice system has the public's attention today like it never has before. You got 650,000 people returning to the communities all across America and communities are saying, you know, what are we going to do? How do we help folks? A little different from than it was, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago when it was kind of it, the community was kind of like indifferent to the prison population. Uh, they could take it or leave it, but now I think they're forced to really consider what they've got to do in the community to welcome people back, to give folks, as the senator said, a second chance and to make services support, uh, available to them so you don't continue that revolving door in criminal justice. So do you think, um, you know, the senator talked about this, and there's been a lot of bipartisan agreement that keeping people out of prison if possible and helping people returning home is a priority. Do you think that's, and you see this in your daily life, so do you think that's really because of changes in hearts and minds, or do you think that that's more of like a pocketbook-driven issue? Well, you know, Rich, I think it's probably a combination of both. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked a lot in the, in the faith community. You've got people uh, of conscience. You've got people uh, seeking justice and right relationships for folks involved. And you also got, you know, when you look at the bottom line, you know, you go down to the economics of it. When you talk about spending, you know, three point one for billion dollars. You know, the community is asking itself, could that money be better spent in some other ways? Affordable housing, education, health care. So that I think that it's driven in both directions. People are certainly compassionate because as you pointed out, and I thank you for your candidness in, in sharing, you've got a little sister that's come back. Across the community, people in, in every walk of life, across every economic, social background, people are finding within their families, within their social networks, they've got people involved in the criminal justice system. So you've got a compassion part there, but you also have an economic consideration that's driving, I think, the attention we're getting in criminal justice. Thanks. Brandon, um, compared to Charles, uh, you're a relative newcomer to this work. <laughs> I, I don't have so. four decades in, but, um, uh, <laughs> but Edwin's pretty quickly has gotten local and national recognition, including the nod from CNN that Senator Portman mentioned. 
Um, I know that even right now there's some future plans for a butcher shop and a bakery, but do you think that the concept concept of Edwin's can work beyond the realm of kind of fine dining and food? Could there be other Edwin's type institutes that address other needs in the community or work with folks who might not want to work in a restaurant, might have other interests and needs? Oh, mo most certainly. I, I totally say that it's possible and it is happening right now. And, and just going back to your, your fact of being new and reentry, absolutely. I'm like a, you know, a naked baby getting you know, smacked in the bottom. You know, I, I just spoke with uh, George Herbeck, who was here at the restaurant last week, and he was talking about the first time him and Charles connected. I think it was back in 77, was it? Or, excuse, excuse me. <laughs> May, I, I, I might be off a couple years. But, um, you know, you're, you're, you're talk, I was born in 1980, and, and um, you know, you, you, you talk about not to date anyone or anything, but to... Um, to, uh, to measure commitment. You know, it's easy to waver in life from anything, whether it's um, you know, a spouse or whether it's a job. Um, I mean, it's been a commitment. So absolutely, this is a, it's, it, it seems like a very uh, new commitment, but I've um, been, been at it for now almost a decade. Uh, and, and across that time, I, could, I found the crossover. Uh, it's very clear that this could happen in any industry. You know, so to your question, uh, can this happen? Can this be expanded, expounded upon? Of course it is. And we're talking about human beings. We're not talking about some sort of uh, you know, equation that needs to be solved. We're talking about giving someone a fair and equal opportunity. And if you can bolster that with some amount of support, whether it be mentorship, whether it be addiction, um, you know, whether it be you know, just guiding someone to their goal, as simple as this, uh, it can be done in any industry. And we've, we've seen it in manufacturing. We've worked with uh, demolition companies. So. Um, it's going on right now today. It's being done in coding with computers. It's being done with many of um, these skilled trades that you would say, hey, why not? Yeah. So um, I happen to know a graduate from the most recent Edwin's class, sure. and uh, he's the father of two of my nieces. And one of the things I was thinking about on that recent day was that um, you know, watching his two girls see him graduate it just really reminded me that the program is about more than jobs. It's about more than um, er getting a skill. Yeah. And there seems to be a ripple effect to that achievement. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen in that, in that realm with some of your graduates, you know, how it impacts their families, their children? Sure, um, you know, it's extremely impactful. And you know, we, we see the evolution of Edwin's in a very short time. I mean, the program is six months long. And uh, we, we've, we say yes to virtually everyone. Uh, so you know, not knowing someone, right? And, and just giving you know, uh, you know, an opportunity, a fair and equal opportunity to, to someone who wants it. You can see the evolution already in the first three weeks. You can see someone being confident after they scored high in a quiz. You can see you know, you know, feathers being puffed, but not too much. You know, we don't, don't want to overdo, you know, we don't want egos. Um, but we, we continually, in Edwin's, switch what's going on every three to four weeks. So when someone you know, faces a challenge, overcomes it, feels confident, switch it around and do it again and do it again and build up this mental, just build that mental endurance up and, and make sure that esteem is running high. Uh, and you see that start to be created in Edwin's. And then outside of Edwin's, of course, that ripple effect just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So um, from seeing, seeing family members come into the restaurant and, uh, you know, hey, this is, this is where my dad works, right? And this is, you know, hey, mom, this is, it's, it's wonderful to see the family element, um, but it's most importantly to see the, uh, the community element when you start to see others cheer for you know, our students. So you start to see maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a church member, uh, but you start to see the community get drawn in to this, this example of hard work and courage. And, and that ripple effect I don't think is measurable. I don't think it's just stays, it stays beyond the household, beyond the community. I think it's affecting us in, in many ways we, we don't even know, but we, we feel, and we feel convicted on, on being a part of it. Thank you yeah. so much. So Ernie, um, we had a chance to speak a couple times before today, and I have to be honest, you told me something that's continued to bother me a little bit. Uh, you mentioned when we first talked about going on cleveland.com to read a story, um, and it's where some of my work appears, and you told me how um, hateful and hurtful some of the reader comments were that were directed at people like you on one of the stories. Um, that, that bothers me, but I, I was hoping that I could ask you to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about that, that problem that we have when people lump together anybody you know, who's a returning citizen, who's formerly incarcerated, and, and they kind of put this attitude out at them. And we talked, we talked a little bit about how you know, monolithic groups and, and deciding who someone is based on that is, is a little bit difficult for someone like you. And, and if you could share a little bit about that, I would appreciate it. Oh, uh, well, 
thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak um, this venerable institution, first of all. Uh, I see some of the board members from um, Edwin's here who have been very instrumental in you know, helping people like me um, become reestablished into the fabric of the community. I think that's very important. Um, specifically to your question, um, first of all, I don't think that we think much about uh, re-entry of people that are coming home from prison, first of all. Um, I know I did not until I found myself uh, uh, embroiled in, in the legal system. Um, and to the extent that we do think about people coming home, as you alluded to, the, um, I went through a program before I entered Edwin's um, and was reading about that particular program and just read a lot of uh, negative comments um, to whereas it seems like the community at large, at least those who were commenting on that particular story, um, were satisfied to have people like me who are coming home from incarceration just be marginalized to the outskirts of society on a perpetual basis. Um, and so I think that goes to the larger point, uh, as you spoke of, seeing um, people who are returning home as a, uh, as a monolithic group. So um, I'm a proponent for obviously um, doing away with that stigma, having one-on-one -on -one conversations to maybe ascertain the, uh, the motivations, the intentions, the goals, uh, needs, and desires of people who are formerly incarcerated. Um, I think that's an important first step. If you're a person who is on the fence about maybe hiring someone who has been in prison, I think that's the first step that obviously you need to take is to uh, approach hiring an ex-felon with a truly open mind. Um, so that's my take on that right there. Do you, can you think of some ways that, or some things we can do better to come up with with maybe programs to, to meet people's needs as individuals rather than kind of as a large group? I mean, is there anything that you encountered that you thought could be done better that would help you with, to get to where you needed to be? Uh, I just think it's, I just have to go back to the Edmonds uh, paradigm, the program that, that I graduated from. And um, I talk about how there, you can't walk into Edwin's and you suddenly become a chef. It doesn't really work like that. So there's an offer uh, from the school to potential students. Um, and what they offer you is the ability to do whatever you wish to do in the culinary arts. Uh, what they expect in return is hard work, um, dedication, uh, teamwork, honesty. There's, a, there's high levels of uh, compassion and understanding um, at, at the school, but uh, there's no room for shortcuts. So it's very, it's very rigorous and demanding. And I think those of us who have graduated from the program are much more prepared to you know, tackle the adversities that, that come with having that. It toughens your skin you know, to go through a program like that. So I can't really speak to the broader issue of what we may be able to do. First of all, you can't, uh, you can't legislate you know, changing of someone's heart. You either have to want to be invested in the renewal of somebody's future, um, or you're not. And the man sitting to my right clearly is, so I'm grateful for that. So we'll just clone him. <laughs> Please don't. Uh, Rachel, really quick to speak on, uh, just to piggyback on Ernie's, what he's saying. Edwin's, you know, everyone thinks this brilliant model, and, and it, truthfully, it, you know, maybe it is. Uh, maybe it isn't. But I can tell you one thing it's based off of is hard work. And it's not just the hard work of uh, uh, you know myself or, or the team around me. It's driven by Ernie. It's driven by every student there. And we're not pulling anyone along. I want everyone to realize this. We don't pull and we don't push. What we're doing is we're just blocking and tackling. So wherever Ernie's dream is or where it may want to go, we're simply just trying to block and tackle. We have board members who you know you know set some of those illegal picks if it has to happen. But we're going to get Ernie to where he's got to go regardless of where it is, and, and we're not gonna take no for an answer. So when you say, is it, is it individual, is it, is it, you know, it's this kind of group thought, um, at Edwin's it's, it's totally boutique. Yeah, and I'd like, to, I'd like to kind of underscore that, you know, we've got a culinary program 
uh, at Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry. And the same thing occurs there when you've got individuals who come through the door. Mm -hmm. They have some aspirations. They want to be involved in that particular industry. But it's, it's the hard work. It's the, it's the cooperation of the staff. It's the equipment that we are able to expose our, our students to and then provide them with the support services. We've got a 90% uh, success graduation rate, you know, with a 70% uh, retention rate after graduation. So I agree with Brandon, you know, to be able to work to help folks actualize uh, what their dreams are, but that's, that's hard work and you've got to provide supportive wraparound services like we do and get folks further out into the industry. I have to thank Brennan too for making sure that we didn't get through in a forum without a football reference in Cleveland because it's like somehow mandatory, right? <laughs> it's got to check that off the list. Um, and, and so Damien, we're going to talk a little bit now and, and we talked a little bit before we came in here about, um, you know, when you came home to Cleveland, you know, thinking about things that you really needed to help put your life back in order, you know, what was available and what wasn't. Okay, well, first of all, <clears throat> me being here today is because of other people, so I have to give that acknowledgement. You know, one of my friends and mentors is in the audience now, and I'd be remiss not to lift them up because one of the things we have to learn is that reentry, like life, is not a spectator sport. You gotta be 10 toes, 10 fingers in because these are people that are extended parts of our communities. And Mansfield Frazier was one of the ones who stepped into the mud. Not only did he support the programs that I was a part of while incarcerated, but he advocated for my release and upon my release, when I was trying to get my own housing, he let me live with him. And I think that that's a par exemplar of that type of spirit and commitment to this particular realm you know, and also I have to give kudos to Charles C. and Luther Metropolitan Ministries because of the host of programs that they run and the things that they do have given me avenues into different opportunities. Now, it's, 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 it's simple algebra. What we do to one side of the equation, you must do to the other. So there's always a lot of talk and emphasis on post-release assistance. And part of that has been as properly identified by um, Charles because of the money situation. So people are more primed to hear. And then on top of that, you have family members now because of the way that we have criminalized certain things that's getting swept up into this system. And so now it's like families are involved, people are listening, you got the money and the families. So when I say algebra equation, what I mean is that there has to be more investment inside the prisons. Fortunately for me, I was heavily invested in the programs while I was incarcerated. They became a way that I did my time and I also learned, as well as many of the men that I was doing time with, that the programs became a wonderful opportunity to not only demonstrate our redeemability through that volunteer work and that type of engagement, but to also network and to also acquire different skill sets. So for example, they have a NAACP in there, which I'm um, proud to say that I was a charter president of, and other organizations like the JCs and Red Cross that men can volunteer in in there. And in the running of these committees, you get certain skill sets and um, tools that you can use and translate opportunities out here, but you get to be around other positive people doing productive things in there. But the problem is, is there was a really a lack of community support in there. Now, you know, I was a part of the Friend to Friend program and the Friend to Friends took people that didn't get visits <laughs> like myself because I did 18 and a half years and sometimes relationships can't withstand the passing of so much time and so they wither away. And so the Friend to Friend stepped in and matched me with a friend, Bill Ott and Roger Friedman, who became my friends and even when my mom passed away, he was able to give me support. That helped me at a very critical time, not only in my development, but in my journey and preparing for release and being able to deal with certain things. And so there needs to be more investment inside the um, institutions, more bridges to the community in there, more, um, one thing I would say is we need, we need to um, offer degrees again inside of prisons, you know, um, I think, I think it was a, a, a very sad mistake when um, under the Clinton administration, they took away our abilities to get degrees while incarcerated. I understood the arguments, but what it did was set us back. And it became a huge challenge to me because 
coming home, trying to get a job and networking in a certain positions, it required a degree. And me having to go back to school, you know, taking time to become a full-time student took me away from that employment that I need. And it kind of stalled. Whereas if I'd have had my degree coming out, I could have really ran into some opportunities. I think that's something to be revisited. Um, more education and awareness of, around some of the things that's offered. Senator Portman just pointed out to me that they extended the work tax credit opportunity, which acts as an incentive for employers to hire returned citizens. You know, and um, also they may have extended the 5,000 federal bonding. These act as incentives for employers, you know, to give a returning citizen the opportunity to prove him or herself true or false. So I think there's opportunities there for education around that. You know, we tell stories in the way we live our lives. So we need to harvest these narratives. We need to lift these narratives up. You know, every day on the news, I shriek when I see somebody who was formerly incarcerated do something stupid. And then it's just blasted and replayed and looped over the news cycle. But where are their stories lifted up consistently like this gentleman? Where are their stories lifted up consistently about the other graduates of Edwin and the other ones who graduated out of programs of Luther Metropolitan Ministries? There needs to be a continual loop of that. People need to see that, be exposed to them stories. And there needs to be investment in those just coming home who uh, has the appetite, the yearning to get some skin in their communities, you know, to sort of help educate them awareness-wise around these issues, create awareness, and then take them out and let them speak. That helps you. Thanks, excuse me. I think it's really important. In, in, in the senator's introduction, uh, he, he referred to the returning citizens as our neighbors. And when we embrace that concept, we want the best for our neighbors, then we begin to do that kind of work and provide the kind of opportunities that uh, Calvert is talking about down there and the kind of opportunities that Ernie got here and the kind of opportunities that we, we provide in both our institutions. These are our neighbors, folks, and we want to, as best we possibly can, provide those kinds of services that get our neighbors on their way. And I, and I think that uh, I'm hoping that, that Senator Portman, I hope you guys have a chance to talk some more. It sounds yeah. like he has some specific ideas yeah. for you, <laughs> and otherwise he might, he might get up on his own uh, campaign to get some of these ideas done. So you might want to take some of those into account. Well, I think they said it properly. You know, they're coming home to a neighborhood near you. And so, if, and, and, and I throw me in that. If we're coming home to a neighborhood near you, wouldn't you want them to have the tools they need to get themselves together? to build themselves up, to reconstruct themselves, and the tools they need to get a employment and the opportunity for employment when they come home so that they can be productive members of society. You know, that's really the type of thinking that we need to all be on the same page on. Absolutely, and so we have to make some, some quick announcements and then we're gonna move into some question and answers. So I'm Rachel DeSell and this morning we're enjoying a panel discussion on the past, present, and future of Reentry programs in Northeast Ohio, featuring Damian Calvert, former participant of Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries Friend to Friend program, Brandon Krastowski, founder and executive chef officer at Edwin's Leadership and Restaurant Institute, Ernie Drain, a graduate of Edwin's Leadership Institute, and Charles C., executive director of Community Reentry at Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries. We're about to head into our Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, city club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our webcast. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. We encourage you to make sure that your questions are brief and to the point. Holding the microphones today are marketing and outreach fellow Faye Walker and office assistant Wesley Allen. May we have the first question, please? <coughs> This would be a good one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mansfield Frazier. Thank you, Damien, for the plug. Your check is in the mail. Uh, <laughs> You're gonna, your phone's going to light up with calls from folks. Thank <laughs> yeah. you now. You know that. <laughs> um, every day in America, more whites come home from prison than blacks. Then why is reentry thought of almost exclusively as a black problem? That's a rhetorical question. Uh, <laughs> That's because, and we hire people at our vineyard 
black, white, Hispanic. We never keep a white guy more than a week or two because he has a social safety net. Somebody hires him. The programs that Brandon run, that Charles C. runs, they're necessary for blacks because that social safety net is not there for persons of color the way it is, that way it is for whites. That, and there's a study, and I won't be long, uh, Deborah Pager did a study that showed uh, she sent guys out to apply for jobs. Some said they had a record, some said they didn't. She proved that a white guy with a record got more callbacks than a black guy with no record. So part of this is part of American culture, and we're not going to solve it in the job market. One of the things we can do, what Damien said, and I've been pushing the Department of Corrections, not getting anywhere, they should take one of their prisons, their 32 prisons, and turn it into a college, that everybody in that prison is studying to advance themselves. That would help tremendously. And because what Damien said, it's a proven fact. The more education you get while you're incarcerated, the easier it is to get a job when you get out. It's, it's just that simple. Thank you. Mansfield, for those of you who don't know, it, it, I mean, you can, you can feel the passion. And, um, you know, w no matter what forum it is, I see Mansfield. And Mansfield sees me. We're, I'm either in the chair, he's on stage, and vice versa. And he hits on so many good points in that, in that, um, that explanation, uh, especially, you know, punctuating with this college, this college uh, thought, turning these, these institutes into colleges. But going back to the race question, I, I believe um, a lot of things. But one of the most passionately is that every human being, regardless of their past, has the right to a fair and equal future. And that's human being. And that, that it shouldn't be, shouldn't be race specific, um, however it is. And, and, and what Edwins is doing, I believe, is, is starting to change the perception of what's possible for someone coming home from prison. And, and granted, you know, 90 plus percent of our students, and I'm, I'm estimating, but it's over 90 percent of our students are African American. But what we continually show and continually prove to not only Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, the United States is that um, not only are we uh, good enough to do this job, but we're, we're, we're better than good. Um, we, can, we can sell you a thousand dollar bottle of wine and, and, and you know, serve you duck confit that we prepared uh, with sauce béarnais that, you know, that we emulsified. And it's starting to prove uh, to a lot of individuals, not only um, our guests, um, not only you know, those watching, um, but our own students that that we're, we're better than good, uh, race aside. And I think we have to continue to take this human approach that we're all, uh, we're all equal. And regardless of what, what the perception is, we, we have to believe and we have to keep fighting for that. Yeah, in, in Mansfield, I would, uh, you, you were requesting that ODRC turn maybe one into a college. I would suggest that they turn them all into <laughs> high institutions <laughs> of learning, you know. And, and I concur. I mean, it's no secret that uh, African Americans are disproportionately represented uh, in the criminal justice system, and that is a result of specific targeting of minority uh, communities and communities of color. So I agree with Brendan. You know, we, we've got an issue. We've got to move beyond race. But that's something I think that the general public has got to lift this voice around and begin to say our neighbors, we don't want our neighbors targeted, we don't want our, our, our neighbors hoarded into uh, in the prisons and marginalized. And the African American community's voice is certainly high about that. But our white neighbors have to join us uh, in that call for justice within the criminal justice system as well. Definitely. And um, I'd like to add just one thing to that. Um, in the programs that I'm a part of, I always remind my peers that it's incumbent upon us to carry ourselves in such a way that we help to shape and to change the perceptions of what our potential is and what we can do and how we contribute. That was part of, that was part of my love for the programs while I was incarcerated because I saw it as an opportunity to change the powers in their perception of our potential. That's why, for instance, in the organization, I held my board members to a high standard because we're trying to shape and change their minds about us. And we have that same responsibility out here. So yeah, we do gotta walk a little more erect. We do gotta be a little more tighter about our program because you know, especially it's a double whammy if you're black with a felony in the community. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm light skinned. I've done caught it from both sides. So you know, I've definitely had to walk that tightrope. But yeah, it's definitely, um, it's incumbent upon us also. 
so that when you're ripe for that revelation, for that change, you know, we can give you that reason. Merle, do you have a question? Oh, good morning. I'm really, really glad the City Club is having this forum. It's a very, very important topic. Um, I'd like an update on the ban the box uh, legislation. I know I think federally something happened, but can, can you just give me, a, first of all, explain exactly what it means and then someone give an update on where we are as far as making it all over the country? Yeah, I know locally here, uh, ban the box, and, and we kind of led uh, the movement, particularly uh, within Cuyahoga County. I know the city has banned the box, uh, the county has banned the box. Yeah, and the ban the box is there on, on each application, there is a box that asks you, have you ever been convicted of a felony offense? And that is the initial application that you fill out when applying for a job. Well, historically, when you check that box, yes, your uh, application went in the file 13, which is the trash can, and folks just weren't called back, never given a chance. The ban the box movement across the country and here across the city and across the county asked that the box be removed from the initial application. Then a person had an opportunity uh, to apply and participate and compete for a job. And the question would not be asked until the person had gone through the process and a job offer was going to be made. The question still gets to get be asked and then people still make uh, reasonable decisions about whether or not you are a hiring person. But if the job you applied for had no, substa uh, no substantial relationship to the offense that you committed, then why shouldn't you be an opportun have an opportunity to work in that job? So the county banned the box, the city has banned the box, I believe the state in some, in some areas has banned the box, and federally, I think that, and Senator, I think you, yeah, the Fair Chance Act. So at, at the federal uh, level, ban the box is also being uh, taken under consideration at this point. And, and it's, it's certainly a good thing. Folks just aren't being blatantly discriminated against as soon as they come through the door. Now, the private sector, though, can still have the box. It's the public sector that's, that's now banned it. Mm -hmm. The private sector can still put that box in there as a private company. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just, I've got a more radical view on this, okay? So, we're working on banning the box, which is a huge first step. It's great. It's going to get someone's foot in the door, toe in the door. Um, however, I believe it's important to show your, your prison record and your perspective that you've gained. There's, there's no more hiding from what you, where you've been, and there's no need to hide from where you've been. It's something that someone should be proud of. And you'll say, Brandon, proud of being proud? Yes. There's a chance for self-reflection. There's a chance to you know, gain some sort of um, um, energy inside of there that, that is incredibly useful outside of prison. So when, you know, when at Edwin's, when someone says, hey, have you been convicted of, of a felony? It's, it's okay to be proud and say, I, I made a mistake, I've overcome it, and, and I'm ready, willing, and more than able to, to accomplish the task that you're asking me to do. And it sounds like a very uh, radical approach, however, if we're, if we're not proud of who we are, where we've come from, and have learned from it, I think that we're going to still be left uh, you know, squirming and uncomfortable when the, the, the obvious question comes up is, have you been convicted of a felony? So it's radical. It's, it's a, it's a, it takes a different, a different opinion on it that takes a different the same point. opinion? <laughs> well, I'll just, I'll, I'll add that, well, first of all, I'm a beneficiary of that. I work for the city of Cleveland in the division of streets. So, you know, I definitely tilt my hat and tap my heart to, you know, the mayor and the people that fought to get that. Because that's how I earn my living. That's how I support my family. That's how, after being my fifth year home, the 28th of this month, just this past 28th is my fifth year home, that my five year goals have been met of, you know, having not one but two jobs, a new car, and purchase a home. That's because of this job. That's because I've done the box. So that's, you know, that's definitely. And um, to give more clarity to what Brandon was saying about, even I had a hard time swallowing the proud part, but I think what he's saying is, you know, just to, to give a living example, when I was working at John Adams High School and somebody reputable served as a reference and the principal said, you know, Damien, you, you come highly recommended, but I don't know how to sell you to my faculty. I mean, you did a very long time for a violent case because I was convicted of murder. 
And um, I don't know how to say to my faculty, let alone the parents. And you know, part of what you're saying is, I said, well, I'm glad you brought that up, principal, because I ain't gonna say his name, but I said, I'm glad you brought that up because in fact, I have 20 years of direct carceral experience. I'm an authority on what not to do and why not to do it. I literally have a PhD in consequences. And so, who better, who better and who more able to have a positive impact on these young souls than one who done lived it, bled it, breathed it. And this is what Brandon is talking about, using that space and that time to self-reflect and for self-introspection and like to find clarity on your purpose. Why am I here? What were the series of decisions and steps that led me here? Because we all have a tendency to look at where we fail as opposed to where we slipped. So you really get the autopsy those slips. So that's what he's saying. And for those of us who go through that process, and I'm not talking, to, and I'm hard on my peers. I'm not talking about my peers who learn to talk and the walk and the lip service to the programs. I'm talking about the ones who take that interior journey, that soul search, like, why am I here? What's my purpose? How do I avoid these mistakes again? How do I give back? And those who take them steps that have that soul change, those are the ones that come out more powerful with a better vision. And by the way, history is full of them. Yeah. History yeah. is full of people that did time, that came out and had an impact. So, FYI. <laughs> Do you have one more question back there? Oh, hello, Lisa Smith from Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry. And I don't know if this is a question or a call to action. In, o in Ohio especially, um, we have two major industries that continue to have blanket prohibitions against individuals who have criminal convictions, education and health care. When or how do we open the doors so that individuals who are able to work in these fields can do so um, and not be discriminated against simply because they have a criminal conviction? I, I've, I've got some ideas. So, you guys full of ideas. It's great. You know, yes. So that's a very good question. And, and you, you, you can quasi add banking to that industry as well, which is big in Northeast Ohio. But you know you have these um, there's cultural compliances and there's these federal and state compliances. Okay, so let's say it's the, the federal and state compliance is not just the culture of a company, but you know something that's mandated from a higher higher uh, government power. Uh, to me, it's it's about leveraging the change. And what I mean by leveraging is, you know, each year in Cuyahoga County we have 4,000 men and women returning home. That's that's what we have. We're the highest in all of Ohio, by double. And I think Hamilton's the next county with 2,000 people coming home. So you have this large um, you know, surplus of individuals who want to work, right? And now you need to create an environment. And whether we're strong arming or whether we're, we're, we're pressing, whatever it takes, but we need industries like the Cleveland Clinic, UH, and so on to say, we want to hire, okay? We want to hire someone coming from out of prison. So now you have this, this pocket of energy that says, we need. And then we have, we want. That's the only way we'll be able to crack, I believe, the legislation that exists for certain felonies to, to, to go around them. But it's up to us as, as, as people. It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna start with government. It's gonna start with people. Asking your local merchants, asking your local doctor, asking anyone that, that you know in the circle of, of, of business saying, how do you hire, is there a dialogue, et cetera. Because now if the people start to say it's necessary, then businesses will say, well, why aren't we doing this? And then of course you have these hungry you know, and able bodies who say, I wanna do this. Then we can go to legislation and say, look it, what's next? You're, yeah, prevent, you're preventing change from happening, but it's got to start with us. And everyone in this seat and everyone watching at home or on air, it's got to start with us. Yeah, I also think, I know Ed, we have Ed Little in the audience here, and when we first started talking about Ban the Box, one of the things, and Brandon, you were talking about being radical, and Ed was quite radical. He talked to the city and he talked to the county, and he suggested that the city and the county, not only do they ban the box, but that they require that those businesses that do business with those agencies that they ban the box as well if they were going to seek contracts and I think when you talk about education and you talk about the healthcare uh, industry I think if, if we can get our local government that have that has already banned the box and taken that initiative to begin to say that we want you who do business with the city who, su who su seek support from the city we want you require you to ban the box as well Ernie, what would, you, what would you want some of those business owners, some of those private business owners to hear from someone like you? 
Oh, well, okay, well, Brandon spoke about, you know, being kind of out there and proud about, you know, speaking about your conviction or having been incarcerated, but I can say that, you know, it never gets any easy, not for me, you know, so it, it, it hasn't been any easier to have those conversations. Uh, there's this uh, a stigma attached um, to incarceration, whether rightly or wrongly. Um, and to Damien's point earlier, um, it's incumbent upon us returning home in order to demonstrate that we've cut loose these, um, if you have criminogenic thoughts or behaviors, that we've done something to uh, ameliorate um, those activities and that we're ready to move forward in society. That takes place on a uh, on a one on one level, you know, sitting down and having a conversation with somebody, and then demonstrating through the course, like through my work, you know, I'd show up to work early, you know, every day, almost every day. Um, I'm honest. I, I work hard, and so I know that there's people coming behind me from Edwin's who I need to lead by example. So when they make that phone call, say, "Well, we have a graduate we'd like you to look at," you know. It's coming upon the, the, the past graduates to, to set an example that says, you know, it's okay to hire these people. I think that's important. Um, you know, there's a psychologist, um, Abraham Maslow, who uh, is probably really famous for uh, the hierarchy of needs. So there's that, there's that pyramid where, you know, um, at the very culmination, at the, at the peak of it is uh, what we call self-actualization. So I guess being the best person that you possibly can be. And some of the qualities of uh, what he says as a self-actualized person is um, self-determination and autonomy and self-sufficiency. Um, and so being employed definitely goes a long way in terms of making a person, you know, self-determined and self-sufficient and autonomous. So um, I think that people should also understand that redemption is can be a very powerful motivator when it comes to sustaining positive change. So now I have something to, to reach for. Um, and that there's a resiliency in each one of us that needs to be uh, tapped into. Um, something that says to the spirit that I want to be better than I was yesterday and I will not accept failure as an option. So we, we can utilize that need for redemption in, in order to bring these people back into the workforce. Yeah. So what we can hope is that some of those business folks that are not in this room are listening to this broadcast and, and, and watching this show later. And I think we have to move on to Senator Portman's closing remarks at this point. Wow. Um, I, I don't want this to end. I don't know about you all. Um, I took a lot of notes, and that was a very informed discussion and uh, really articulate discussion. Um, so Damien is over at Case Western Reserve. I think you should be teaching somewhere too, Ernie. I'm not sure where. Maybe it's a philosophy department someplace, but very, very articulate uh, description of you know the, the broader issues. Uh, I was so impressed with what I heard, Charles, about you having been there, 90% uh, graduation rate, 70% retention rate at Lutheran Ministries, that's amazing. That's a great success rate, and, and, and they, don't, they don't screen people. I mean, it's not, it's not as if they're trying to find people who are definitely going to be able to succeed. They take everybody and anybody, and uh, that's amazing. Brandon talked about the ripple effect with families and this whole idea of rethinking uh, stigma. That was very interesting. Uh, and uh, Damien, gosh, everything you said uh, was interesting, but and my favorite, of course, is PhD in consequences that you have. Uh, but this notion of more investment in prisons, and when you were used one word, you said when people were ripe for revelation. And I think that's interesting. Um, to um, the point about hiring, I will say the Greater Cleveland Partnership has done some roundtable discussions that have helped organize where you get business people around a table to talk about hiring. And the most powerful thing by far, uh, Rachel, and, and this is understandable, I suppose, is business people who have gone through the experience of hiring people, giving them a second chance, and what has happened. And it's exactly what you heard today. Loyalty, hard work, showing up early, uh, dedication, gratitude. 
And um, that experience, hearing it from a peer, is really important. So maybe this is an opportunity for us uh, to do another forum sometime with the business leadership of Cleveland, small business, medium-sized business, everybody come together and say, what is the experience? Get that testimony. So my job is to close this down because we're, we're at, at the end here. Um, clearly, uh, we learned a lot today about what we need to do in terms of a more comprehensive solution. Um, I'll continue to work on these issues like the Second Chance Act, reauthorization, and of course the Fair Chance Act to the point about ban the box at the federal level. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a very valuable discussion. I hope everybody agrees with that, and I hope this now again will launch some additional discussion and some action. So I thank you for your presence here today. Again, to all the panelists and to Rachel, certainly great, great job. Um, and uh, thank you for your commitment to serving our communities and our neighbors, Charles. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a panel discussion on the past, present, and future of reentry programs in Northeast Ohio. So special thanks to today's table sponsors, the Edwins Leadership and Restaurant Institute Board of Directors. The community partners for today's forum are the Effective Leadership Academy, uh, Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry, of course, Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. We thank all of you for your support. Again, thanks to the panelists. Thanks to you, Rachel, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The forum is now adjourned, and I get to do this again. <laughs>